Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, capacity management and provisioning. Uh, the kind of subtext is the cloud's full, you can't build here. It's kind of a riff on uh, the scene from Forrest Gump where he's trying to find a seat on the bus and no one's going to allow him to sit down. Uh, this is kind of the experience that we've had at Rackspace with the public cloud in terms of what has happened capacity-wise that prevents instances from building. My name is Andy Hill. Uh, Joel Pries is with me and Matt Van Winkle. So the public cloud capacity at Rackspace, um, we've deployed over 100 cells in the last two years. Uh, we're constantly, we, we usually have five or six cells in flight. We're constantly adding new capacity to every region. Our process used to take a uh, systems engineer three to five weeks uh, after getting the gear handed over to them with a bare metal install. And now we've taken the process from three to five weeks for a skilled engineer down to the operator that's on shift is adding capacity and the new cells are coming up and it's little as one day but usually it takes around a week for a new cell to come online and the restraint there is around networking. Uh, Top of, rack, top of rack network configuration kind of has some issues around automation. We still don't have the right pieces in place to make that as well oiled of a machine as the rest of our provisioning that we do. Uh, around the control plane sizing, so like our Nova DB, our Nova scheduler, the sizing of those nodes that we run, we kind of have to have some uh, ideas around the data plane and its impact on those nodes. So for example, if we have a very, very wide data plane that's doing lots and lots of downloads and uploads of images from Glance, we have to scale out our Glance architecture. And then the other kind of impact with the number of compute nodes or the size of our data plane, the breadth of the data plane, I guess, is how large should our Nova DB be? Uh, if we have 600 hosts for a given cell, and each one of those could have up to 25 instances on it, and the instances are turning all the time, that's a ton of records in the Nova DB, right? So we have to kind of pay close attention to the sizing of our cells in terms of the number of compute nodes that are involved, and then the sizing of the control plane components that orchestrate that data plane. The other kind of sizing considerations that we make for cells are around private addressing space. So <clears throat> uh, if you think about one of those very large cells that I just mentioned, it could be up to a slash 17 for the private addressing space. And that's a really large broadcast domain for the instance traffic. Um, and once you get to broadcast domains that are around that size, it gets kind of interesting on the open vSwitch side of things, to say the least. Um, we have a presentation later on today that's going to get into detail on that, but uh, yeah, <laughs> shameless plug, right? We're, we're talking about that more the details around it, but that's just one of the kind of considerations that we have for our build outs of the cell sizing. Um, and then there's kind of the unsung, uh, underappreciated consideration for your cell control plane sizing, and that's more around overhead and complexity. So. We don't have infinite resources at our hands for the control plane. We have to right size everything. Um, and you can't just add nodes and services and uh, different components to each cell because that's more complexity for the operators. That's more complexity for deployers. That's just more complexity overall. So we really try to right size with the size of the, the cell and its nodes, minimize that so that the control planes that we sp spin up are as cheap as they can be and um, as simple as they can be as well. Some of the hypervisor uh, provisioning kind of considerations that we have to make are around uh, cow images. So like copy on write images, if you're familiar, if you're kind of coming from a VMware world, it's the, the snapshot of a VM that kind of hung around forever and ended up filling your drive. Um, you have to kind of plan for some overhead. With Zen Server, that, over, that uh, cow image size can be two times the size of the disk. So that can really be painful. Um, and then 
Sometimes there are problems with cleaning up these snapshots afterward. So if we're using software to create the snapshots and to clean up the snapshots, sometimes those fail and can lead to scenarios where the, the disks are full on the hypervisors themselves. Uh, <coughs> we also do pre-caching of images at Rackspace. So the, the standard images that you get whenever you sign up for Rackspace, like your Ubuntu image, your Fedora image, those kinds of images, uh, we call them base images, and we cache those directly on the hypervisors themselves to make the, down, to make the build times as fast as possible. Well, that's also some drive space overhead that we have to account for whenever we're sizing everything out. Otherwise, we could fill up the drive just like we were talking about. So the, with the combination of the pre-cache images and the cow overhead, we can end up having some interesting scenarios that you should really be aware of um, for sizing out your hi hypervisors. And these are just the Nova config options um, for that uh, pre-caching option. And uh, okay, so the other kind of things to be cognizant of whenever you're thinking about sizing out a cell and its control plane and those kinds of things. Sometimes pretty, pretty awful things happen with the hypervisors that are uh, being used, right? So you need to have some excess capacity for emergencies. If you don't have a spare chassis to put customers on whenever an existing chassis crashed, that's a really bad situation. So there's some uh, options within Nova cells to set a, res a reserve. Um, the other thing is that you're kind of bound for a cell, so it's not like we can just move you to another cell that has capacity. Cells itself doesn't support moving instances from one cell to another. And then kind of the final like gotcha that we encountered from a how do we size our data plane and how do we size our control plane was around VM overhead. So there's a tiny amount of overhead that each VM has that's directly related to stuff like the number of vCPUs that it has, the number of disks that are attached, all of that kind of stuff. And however tightly you're trying to pack your hypervisors, you're trying to maximize those hypervisors, this overhead can really start to matter and be an important factor. So uh, there's now accounting for that overhead in the scheduler, um, and there's links to the patches that landed, this is all available today. And I'm gonna hand over to Joel for the uh, bigger problems that we've seen in production. Hey everybody, I'm, I'm Joel. I'm gonna be talking about, um, as Andy mentioned, some of the kind of big gotchas that we get when we're trying to scale out our infrastructure to meet the needs that we see. Um, there are way more than we could probably cover in this in the time that we have here, but these are some of the main ones that we run into. Uh, so specifically around load balancers, and that could kind of also be expanded out to load balancers, firewalls, just any kind of single point uh, you might have, uh, be, say between cells in your regional control plane or the regional control plane and uh, uh, just your ingress. Oh, you went ahead real fast, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Glance and Swift is a big thing. Uh, from the control plane standpoint, um, just in terms of pure networking, that's where you're gonna be generating the vast majority of your bandwidth, and so that's where you hit a scaling point uh, on that side of the house before pretty much anything else in terms of running the cloud. Um, fraud and non-payment instances. Uh, if you are not running a public cloud, if you either are deploying uh, private clouds or it's just something for internal use, uh, this might not come up, but when you start getting into a large public deployment, this becomes a major deal for capacity um, Routes, routes, routes. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit. Just routes, so much routes. And road testing, and by that I mean testing this new capacity that you're adding and how to adequately do that. So load balancers. Um, yeah, it's it can become a very quick single point of failure or at least a single point that you can easily saturate things. Um, so up there we have uh, alternate routes needed for high bandwidth operations. Uh, Specifically, that pretty much refers to Glance and Glance traffic for us. Um, we have an alternate routing path that we can go through that circumvents these devices for us, specifically for Glance uploads and downloads, so that we are not saturating those. Um, it slows things down when we do, obviously, and then the other shared services that are going through those connections can start to fail, like your database connections and that kind of stuff. 
Um, that's another one that we have listed up there specifically, database queries. Um, if you were in the talk before, that was in this room where uh, um, they did a, a pretty pretty good deep dive of some very nasty queries that were that are coming in. Uh, we've seen some pretty bad scaling issues where uh, unoptimized database queries were sending way more traffic through the load balancers than they should have been uh, to the point that we were saturating or near saturating those connections. And a lot of really good work was done to sort of catch a lot of those and bring that data down. But that's something you have to be really aware of when you're adding new capacity and especially if you're uh, deploying to multiple environments. Uh, we've seen cases where um, things look great and we were doing it in some of our smaller regions and then we moved on to the larger ones and it was like, uh-oh, like this, this was an exponential growth for, for this particular problem and that step up, you know, um, we crossed the tipping point in, mov in moving up. So you really have to keep an eye out um, in your pre-production and when you're analyzing potential changes coming down the pike that you're looking at increase per instance for things like database traffic so that you can uh, accurately plan around that. Um, yeah. Good. All right, Swift and Glass bandwidth. Uh, I talk about this quite a bit. Again, single bottleneck. Um, one thing we do to keep an eye on this so we know when we need to add capacity for to handle this is we have triggers based around build times um, or alerting based on build times and imaging times. <coughs> if we see those start to slow down, then we know that we're hitting some type of scaling point uh, in load for swift uploads and downloads. Um, a big thing here that would help, I think, considerably is Glance API nodes. We don't share the cache between them. So if, say like if you have 20 Glance API nodes that are handling your d image downloads, if 10 of them have an image and 10 don't, you have a 50% cache hit ratio. Um, it would be a pretty neat feature to be able to for the Glance API nodes to themselves talk and share that, share that knowledge among them so that if one or two of them have an image cache that's, say, pretty popular, like, um, you know, it could be a customer's image, um, a custom one, not one of your base images, something like that, um, it could defer to one of the nodes that does have it so that you're saving, you're not uh, using bandwidth you might not need to by uh, reaching out to Swift uh, or whatever your image store is. Um, we need to get image downloads out of path or Im sorry, wait, we should do uploads. Well, anyways, we need to get uh, image transfers out of path if we can. And by that I mean using the Glance API node is essentially a proxy for your traffic to Swift from the hypervisors can be a real pain. Um, you're making a single point that all, that you're concatenating basically all of your traffic through for those transfers. Um, you hit an, you can run into some really interesting problems there. And I'll get into that kind of towards the end of the slide here. Um, we try to avoid these things by caching the base images. Uh, as Andy talked about, the, you know, we ha the base images are, you sign up for Rackspace, you do, a f you do an image list, those images. If we're rolling out a new Glance API node, we'd be sure to at least seed it with all of those images so it's ready to go as soon as it goes into production. Um, we also try to pre-seed images to hypervisors ahead of time if possible. Um, and we saw some really big improvements on that in some specific use cases. Uh, for instance, uh, our uh, big data as a service offering, Hadoop offering, uses a very limited set of, Im of images they have. And so we made 100% sure that all of their hypervisors have their images on them when they're good to go. And that was a dramatic improvement for their build times, obviously. Um, just everything was good to go. And we're using the um, fast cloning for Zen server, which you can read about on the wiki there. So that um, makes it, the image provisioning part of becomes almost near instant for those at that point. It's basically just make a new cow and you're good to go. Um, for troubleshooting problems on this side, Glance and Swift and I guess just overall uh, OpenStack projects aren't as great as they could be at sharing request IDs. When you're trying to track those problems down, um, can become pretty interesting. It would be really great if you had an actual single request ID that you could use throughout the entire stack, but having to switch between this request ID and then going over to the Swift transaction ID, which can be different, to try and find where your bottlenecks are here, um, can become very difficult, and that makes thus planning for f uh, adequate capacity moving forward much more difficult. Um, so what happens if you can't scale out anymore? 
That means you have to like horizontally scaling specifically. Um, we reached a point when we were relying almost entirely on horizontal scaling for our Glance API nodes. And as Andy mentioned, unfortunately, we don't have an unlimited capacity or unlimited resources to throw at things. And we reached a point where we couldn't do that anymore. We couldn't just add more Glance API nodes like we were doing because we were running into saturation problems at you know the next layers up um, on the networking side. So we had to actually re-architect and uh, move over to new hardware entirely using 10, 10 gig NICs. We had to start spreading across to different air, different um, segments of our network to spread that traffic to different aggers, different topper racks. We have to you have to really keep an eye on that. Um, otherwise, you're going to start impacting other services, not just uh, Swift and Glance specifically. So fraud and non-payments. Uh, fraud. How do we handle those at Rackspace? Uh, we immediately mark them as suspended as soon as the account is flagged as fraud. And that's great. It stops somebody from being able to you know, use those uh, resources for, uh, that you're providing for free. However, it still takes up capacity while they're around. So what do you do about that? You don't want a bunch of these suspended fraud instances just sitting there taking up room. Uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, something like that, uh, we developed an internal tool called Account Actioneer, which basically uh, looks at uh, our internal auth system, our user base, and looks at the accounts that are flagged as fraud, and it um, has a set of business logic in there to say, hey, this is fraud. It was marked as fraud X amount of time ago. We are confident at this point that this was, in fact, real fraud, and we're not just suspending and deleting somebody's instance that shouldn't be. I'm going to go ahead and clean this up. So uh, our rules for that on fraud are pretty aggressive. Like, if we have a whole team devoted to deciding if somebody is legitimate, if uh, you know their person or not, and we take their word for it more or less. So uh, once something is marked as fraud, it's pretty aggressively deleted so that it's not taking up space in our cloud. Non-payment is very similar to fraud, but it's worse uh, in terms of capacity management. Because um, if it's non-payment, that means it got past the fraud stage probably, and at some point they did give us money. And we're a company, and we like money quite a bit actually. It's almost one of our favorite things. And so we want, <laughs> <laughs> and so we want them to give us money, and we don't want to be you know, in a point where somebody might have gone through a rough spot and, you know, they couldn't make their bill, but they want to. We want them to be, come back into the fold, so to speak. So we try to give them much more time to come back um, into being, you know, into rack space, basically. So it's very similar account action here, still handling those. It just has a different set of rules that's much more lenient in terms of t uh, turnaround time before it deletes the instance. Um, but again, from capacity management, it's worse for us because we have to, we have to maintain that for quite a bit longer. Uh, this is where something like shelving instances might be a nice feature to have um, or that we could leverage so that we could completely shelve the instances someplace um, and they're not taking up that capacity. Uh, but then, say, you know, several months down the road, if somebody decides they want to come back, like, oh, hey, yeah, we still got that instance. Sure. Welcome back. Uh, road testing. Uh, you have to aggressively test any new hypervisors you, you throw out there. You don't obviously want to just, you know, bootstrap something and assume it worked and uh, hope for the best. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, with a new cell, it's pretty easy. Uh, we use bypass URLs, and by that we mean cell-specific API nodes. Um, so those are basically configured like, uh, how many like how many people in here are actually using cells? All right. Us up on the stage and our friends in the front row. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the, uh, our, what we call the bypass URL cell specific API nodes are probably more similar to what the rest of you who don't use cells see. Um, it's just an API node that doesn't know it's in cells and it's built to directly talk to the cell that we're provisioning. So when we're doing our testing for that before we link that cell up to our regional control plane, um, we build using that API node. So that bypasses the region. There's no way that customers can uh, inadvertently build to that cell in any way. Um, once we're finished testing and we link it up to the region, we delete that cell-specific API node. Because once we're on the region, we can use scheduler hints to send to, the, to that cell directly. Um, we're looking at potentially moving forward using cell tenant restrictions. Um, so we could link the cell up entirely, but then have it, say, uh, set up so that only our QE tenants basically could build to it. Um, and that would allow us to more fully test the entire pipeline for building a, the or for building to the cell, making sure everything is working. Um, 
it, this is a lot harder when you're adding new capac or when you're re-adding capacity, or sorry, adding capacity to an existing cell. Um, sometimes we don't provision an entire cell at once. We get you know certain cabs in certain time, and we we put them on as soon as we can. So we might be just it might just be a new cab that got delivered. Or it could be a re-kick, like if a host we failed out for hardware problems and whatever that problem was was rectified and we we're putting it that set, that uh, that hardware back in, how do we test to that? Um, that cell is already linked up to the region. We can't stop, it might be in production already, we can't stop or want to stop customers from building to that cell as a whole. Um, and there's no way to disable a compute node or a hypervisor but still be able to test build to it. We can disable it, obviously, but then our test builds fail. Um, so that makes things a lot trickier because we want to test to that node and we want to test with it in the cell that it's in and everything, um, but we can't prevent customers from potentially being able to build to it. I mean, uh, we've got a huge amount of builds coming in. We, even if you just flip it on just for one second and try and get your build in and then close it back down, like odds are pretty good that somebody might land on there. So um, it, that's a real interesting challenge for us. And I'm going to hand it over to Matt. He's going to talk about Matt stuff. So, um, so these guys, just to put in perspective, do most of the heavy lifting. You know, I'm the BDI manager type. But even capacity planning and management, uh, with respect to OpenStack and just in a business, has a few tricks to it at that level. Um, specifically around the supply chain and how you sort of handle this ever-flowing stream of boxes of different configurations. Um, some of our own decisions from a product development standpoint and how that changes the way we, we plan capacity. And ultimately, there's still some challenges from upstream that the guys touched on and we'll, we'll visit here again in a second. Um, so, you know, when you start dealing with public cloud or even internally, if you start to say expand to more and more groups, if you're running an internal cloud, you start to get different sort of constraints around capacity planning. Um, my favorite is the large customer requests. Hey, I'm a sales guy and I know that this customer is gonna need six terabytes of capacity right now. And we're like, really right now? Or, you know, over time. <coughs> but you have to sort of look at those kinds of requests and you have to think about them in terms of um, overall capacity, oversubscriptions, those sorts of things. And sometimes that does actually impact the speed at which you pull in your supply chain, uh, expect delivery of cabinets, and, and, and how you sort of plan uh, what's being built out next and in what regions or what areas of the, of the deployment. We have a lot of triggers we look at. The, the easiest one, easy one is the percent used. Um, in a given space, you know, we're 70%, okay, it's probably time to order. Uh, the trickier one, at least when you're dealing with finance departments and some of the other folks that you sometimes have to deal with, is the largest number of slots available. So again, we offer a, a range of um, sizes in any of our flavor classes. Some of them include whole host, uh, sort of you can have an instance that takes up all the RAM on the host effectively. <coughs> Um, in those particular flavor classes, it's very important to track the amount of those empty hosts that are available, regardless of percentage. Uh, because we can actually run into problems where, say, a new region or a smaller region, um, you know, we may only be at six, 50, 60 percent capacity, but there's no room for the largest instances to build in that flavor class. And that's just as bad as being out of capacity altogether. So th that's the, the trickier one, but we, we uh, try to keep an eye on it. And then ultimately, we're also a public cloud provider, so you know, IPv4 addresses become an interesting constraint uh, to, to deploy deploying capacity. Uh, we have a lot. Uh, we'd love a lot more, but that's kind of hard to do these days. So um, we're still, you know, as Aaron sort of wraps up its allocation, for example, in the US, um, the process of getting more is very stringent. So we're sort of stuck waiting on the company to negotiate its next round of IP addresses, both for us and for our dedicated business. Um, and sometimes that means we're like watching some graphs get dangerously close to, to numbers we don't like while we have gear sitting there and all we need is the public IP addresses to drop on it to sort of support the customers. <coughs> so that'll get more interesting as time goes on, obviously. Um, the other big thing about it is schedulers, the sales and scheduler services in Nova aren't aware of IP addresses as a, as a constraint for scheduling builds. Um, that's something we're trying to start to talk to people about because that's actually probably more useful for us right now than the RAM. Um, typically, we run into more problems from IP addresses and provisioning than we do from RAM and provisioning. Um, then we have a couple of, of services we've built, Auditor and Resolver. Some of that work we've talked with, the, there's a small project around the, in the community called Entropy. We've talked with those guys a little bit that does some of the same functionality, but basically these are services that help us keep an eye on various aspects of the environment 
and in some cases we'll take action. The simplest one I can describe is we actually have an ability to weight down a cell for builds as soon as it IP thresholds drop below a certain amount. It'll actually go in and update that information. Now we're still fighting for an actual disable flag because if you've ever, well, they don't use cells, but uh, cell weighting is kind of magic voodoo that doesn't always, it's not like an on or off, it's a, it's a relative value. And so you can try to attempt to not build, build to one and yet it still wins because it has the most available RAM. Um, and they, they, these guys alluded to this, but this is kind of an interesting aspect to how we, how we manage capacity. Our control plane actually runs on an OpenStack installation itself. Um, so we actually stand up a small private cloud, if you will, and in there we build all the instances. We build instances that become the control plane for the public cloud. So when we talk about horizontal scaling, we literally were just spinning up more and more instances until we sort of saturated uh, the top rack switches that supported that little environment. And to do the Glance expansion, we actually went out and stole performant hardware from the customer <laughs> fleet and made them into bare metal boxes. Um, and we're now circling back and making some other changes for that. All right, so from a product management perspective, we're always trying new things. I think in the last just over a year, about 13 months or so, we've added four completely new flavor classes. We've renamed two of those, but each one of those brought with them a completely different hardware footprint, which meant a different VM density, which meant a different amount of sizing per cell and a different number of cabinets per agar. And so you start to sort of, um, I think we have six or seven different types of, of flavors that we manage across all the different regions. And so that just, that's just more variables you have to play with. Um, also, we're, re we're constantly doing code deploys. I mean, our goal is to try to stay relatively close to trunk. I mean, we, we're usually within a few weeks. I want to say the one we're testing right now is from mid-October, so we're not, not too far off. Um, but again, that has kind of its own pace of deployment, and then you have all these new capacity coming along, and so there's always that period of time where you have to sync and make sure that, okay, we started this cell, we deployed a new version of the region, then we go back and patch this cell before we flip it on and cause all kinds of havoc. Um, even, within, um, even within our different hardware classes, we have multiple vendors, and so sometimes we actually find subtle differences in using hardware from vendor X versus vendor Y, and in our oldest sort of, it's called standard, our oldest flavor class, we actually have three separate vendors, and in two of the cases, we have multiple revisions of the hardware from that vendor. Now, typically, that doesn't hurt us at the Nova level, but from a total capacity management standpoint, we do find quirks along the way, so it ends up meaning all of our tooling has to sort of be able to determine, like, which of the seven hardware variants is this. Um, and then, of course, non-production environments uh, additionally take strain on capacity from a, not only a hardware resources, but time and effort and tooling uh, spent getting those up in, in competition with the production environments. So upstream, um, like I said earlier, a disabled flag for cells. A lot of our upstream needs really cir circle around cells. There's actually three sessions going on this design summit specific to cells, um, one today and two tomorrow. Uh, the Nova team's looking to sort of feature complete it, possibly even make it the default in sort of a no-op single cell, don't have to worry about it kind of model. Um, but disable flag, the sable flag for, for the cells is big. Also for the host, like the guys talked about, just being able to, to manage like an admin only flag or a disable flag that allows me to build te tests to a specific host without sort of exposing it to customers before testing. Scheduling based on IP capacity that I talked about and just overall the, sun, the, the feature completion pieces. Um, I know it's being pushed very heavily by Michael Still uh, and quite a few of our core devs are involved in those discussions. I think I'm gonna, we're gonna be sitting in them um, today and tomorrow to kind of make sure from an operator's perspective uh, those things see their way through. Um, but I think in order to give folks time for questions, is that the last one? Yeah. Uh, we have a couple minutes left, so any questions? This one? It, it's, it's most likely, it, disable host, yes, but we've had trouble with So availability zones is part of the feature completion for cells. So this is wrapped up in the first class citizen stuff for cells. Um. Yeah, if we can disable the host and we can deploy to it and do everything we want to set it up, but then it's difficult to then test that while it's still disabled without exposing it to customers to also build to. You, even if you do a scheduler hint, even directed at it, it will fail if it's disabled. So we can flip it on do a like a full host build to it real quick and hope that we get in there first but
Yes, so can, so, but if it, the flag is set to disabled, it fails for us. It comes back with the scheduler failure. I, I'd like to know more, but at the same time, we want a full-fledged VM because we also test a bunch of stuff inside the VMs, so. To have, we would prefer to have an admin disabled so we could do a full, complete. Th I mean, that's that's what we would like to. Yeah, be our to goal do. is around road testing the entire node, making yeah. sure all the networking and everything for the instance yeah. comes up properly. So we we can do some stuff to get around it and get a build there and do it safely. But like we would, we would prefer it to be supported and be trunk basically. Worth and you're not trying to do anything funky. We would just like to say, only let admin build to this basically would be ideal. Hmm. So like number of nodes in a cell versus the amount of control plane nodes we, we put to them? Yeah, so cells are going to vary. We have any some that run around uh, 100 up to some that are like 600 hosts or hypervisors. A lot of that depends on which type of hardware they are. Um, for that, we run, what is it? We have cells, scheduler, yeah, we we actually don't run all of the OpenStack services on a single node. We run a separate node for Nova Scheduler, a separate node for the various components, right? Um, it it comes down to. Um, so I'd say for I think our target right now for a most of our cells we're trying to get to the database pairs that are about eight gig instances. Um, running in our in our private cloud, and then the scheduler and cell services run as like fours or eights as well. And yeah. I think that's pretty much all you need for the cell itself. Now, where we I'd say we don't have the math completely right is the sort of I won't say auto scaling, but the scaling the APIs and the glance nodes and stuff in conjunction. We're still trying to we do it over time, but I don't think we have an exact math that says when I get to. 15 cool. cells, I need 12 API nodes. And yeah, and it's also kind of a function of the use of the cell and, and what happens over time. So, um, for instance, one cell may have a bunch of instances that are booted and then they stay online forever. And then another cell may have a bunch of instances that are booted and deleted, which ends up really adding some database constraints to it because it keeps all those deleted rows. So in conjunction with all of this, we have to come up with a consistent pruning plan to kind of give us an assurance that the database nodes are under similar load and so that we can size them consistently, all that stuff so that we're... Yeah, I, I can give you a specific example because we were looking after the last talk on database performance. We've just recently pruned our global database in two of our regions and in both cases, it, just keeping 90 days of deleted instance information means I have several hundred thousand deleted instances in those databases. So it's it's a good problem to have, right? But it's it, it does pose interesting challenges when you start to get to those kinds of things. Uh, do you guys use uh, host aggregates? And if so, how do you exactly define your preferred aggregates? So not yet. Host aggregates is one of those features that we get when they finally feature complete cells. I actually like the idea of host aggregates for a couple possible reasons. Um, it might allow us to actually start mixing flavor classes and or hardware vendor variations within the same cell and be able to control some live migraine and some other really touchy things that want stuff to be pretty exact. Um, also, the testing pieces may become a lot easier because you can start to say, well, these cabs are already in production. These cabs are new. We're adding them to an existing cell. We're going to throw them in their own host aggregate and route builds based on that. So we don't today, but I'm actually pretty excited about the potential for using host aggregates, especially in the capacity management space. So they're internal right now. We call them auditor and resolver. We are exploring how we can. Oh, Actioneer. Actioneer. That's another one. We it, it literally just looks at our account services feed coming out of our. Yeah. Well, there, we there's are the open source tool Entropy, which kind of mirrors some of the auditor resolver functionality. And we're looking at a couple other projects where we might be bringing some of this code to. It. These these are all just things that we've built really in the last six to nine months, except for Actioneer. Um, and so we're still at that phase where we're getting it right for ourselves and then understanding which projects they line up most closely with upstream. So. Anything else? Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, you can catch us up here.